All right, folks, behind every event, there is somebody who is spending money on this, right? So I would like to recognize the chief academic officers of the uh, Kebo institutions, if they are here. Please stand up. Thank you very much. Uh, the committee has been charged to run this conference by the Council of Chief Academic Officers. Um, and thanks for coming. We really appreciate you coming all the way here. I think I'm not going to take any more time. Uh, I'm going to give the podium to Dr. Allen again, the other Dr. J. Hi. Um, does everyone have a bead? Everyone has a bead? If you don't have a bead, we have phenomenal assistants who have beads. Raise your hand. If you don't have a bead, they will assist you. Um, do I still have 50 minutes? Or are we trying to get back on schedule on my time? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you. And I'll be thoughtful. I won't take a whole lot more. So, how are you doing? Good. If we cut, if we said right now, let's break camp, how many of you have actionable items you are prepared to do as a result of being at this conference already. Wow, that's awesome. Give yourselves a round of applause. As well as give all of the presenters and colleagues and from whomever you got those actionable items. So we are going to, in a relatively short amount of time, work on an extremely complex yet important concept known as privilege. And we're gonna do it in an interactive fashion. I'm going to do an extremely abbreviated version of an exercise called the Privilege Beads Exercise. Has anyone ever done that? Wow, nobody. You are so gonna to wanna to do this one. Uh, at the and so that's my goal, is that you will have yet another actionable item tool that you can use, but also in the process of me sharing this with you, which may be as important, you will have a deepened understanding of the complexities of this concept called privilege and how it can help us to transform, transform our teaching and our learning. And the foundation for sharing this comes from a quote from Paulo Freire. If you haven't gotten it yet, he is one of my favorite sources of inspiration. And he said that education either functions as an instrument, instrument, which is used to facilitate integration of the younger generation into the logic of the present system, right? So what we can do is we can just help them in the present system, right, and bring about conformity. So that's one of the things that we might through, what we're doing with students in education, just help them in terms of conforming with the present system. Or education becomes the practice of freedom. Just think about that. Education as the practice of freedom, the means by which men and women deal critically and creatively, men and women deal critically and creatively with reality and discover how to participate in the transformation of their world. So, He's basically saying anything that we do is either going to help, for the most part, you know, conform, keep things, as they're saying, integrate, or 
help our students in terms of this sense of the practice of freedom and how they can critically and creatively help to transform our world. So that's the foundation as we think about how we might transform teaching and learning by unpacking privilege. So I'm gonna share a couple of stories and then we're gonna go right into privilege and unpacking privilege and how it can transform teaching and learning. Well, um, I invited myself in 2001 to the downtown Denver campus from the CU Boulder campus, primarily because I had worked at CU Boulder for about uh, 12 years. And that's the longest I'd ever worked anywhere. I like change. Uh, so I was, two grad doctoral students asked me to write letters of recommendation for them for a job in the communication department on the downtown Denver campus. And as I was writing, you know how you write letters, you wanna talk about the match, et cetera. I said, I, I could match there, right? I have qualifications and experiences and interests. So I invited myself. I called uh, Dr. Sonia Foss, who was chair at that time, and I said, I know you're looking for, at that time I was an associate professor, I know you're looking for an assistant professor, but if you're interested in upping that to associate, I'd like to come. So she said, are you kidding me? Of course. And so I ended up, you know, we made that happen. And by the way, I learned that because I was paying attention to processes, right? How people get things done. And that was partly because I was an outsider within. And sometimes people who don't know the ropes and what's going on, sometimes we learn better how systems work than people who are entrenched in them. So this is another part of how difference can matter, right? Of the kind of experience you have or you don't have. At any rate, um, I, I came to that campus. I got promoted to full professor. I became a department chair. And in my role as department chair, I was surprised to learn that my faculty colleagues as they selected textbooks, they didn't even look to see how much they were gonna cost our students. And I was surprised at that because of my background as first generation, my background as uh, needing to work for, I got a full ride the first year, and then I had to work and somehow make you know, ends meet. So from my background, which is one in terms of social class, of not a background of privilege, that knowledge and my now being in that role of influence actually made a difference that speaks to how privilege and its, and its many elements, right, can make a difference in terms of transforming teaching and learning. So what I did in that case is I asked them minimally to just kind of do some homework and see how much they might cost. Uh, also, to be sure they put though there, at that time we were relying a lot more on textbooks, maybe than some people are now, but also to think about, are you really going to use the whole book, right? To think about if you are, put it on reserve, and put it on reserve overnight, not just two hours, because many of the students on that campus worked, et cetera, et cetera. And make sure the students know that, because also for some of my colleagues, um, and whether or not they were coming from middle class initially or not. Some people just have a different approach to life based on their identities, where for them it would be like, well, they can just ask me, I have some extra copies. But some students wouldn't necessarily know to do that, wouldn't necessarily think it's appropriate, you see what I mean? So uh, that's just one story, one example, specifically of how my own identity in, a, uh, in the terms of social class is where I grew up with not a lot of privilege because of that, and yet because that's the background I bring, that's value I can add because I have that knowledge, right? Second story, and this one is now, that was a downtown Denver campus. This is back at CU Boulder. Uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Anna Spradlin, invited me out to lunch, and she seemed a little apprehensive. I didn't know what was going on. She and I had developed a very, very strong um, collegial relationship based on how we approach teaching in particular. So um, she actually came out to me as lesbian. And I'm, I'm almost ashamed to tell you, even though that was 20 some years ago, at that point I wasn't even familiar with the notion of coming out, right? Nor, and later I began, I learned 
how challenging it is for some people who are GLBTQ identified, some, not all, this idea of, of constantly coming out, coming out, coming out, right? Or deciding, do I come out? Do I disclose? It's pretty taxing. That was so news to me, right? And that's because I'm straight and I have the privilege of being straight. And what I did with that aha moment for me of realizing my privilege as a heterosexual is I then, because I was uh, heading up the organizational communication introductory class, and I had graduate assistants reporting to me. So I had those graduate assistants. I found some readings in organizational communication, one of which eventually uh, became a, a, an article that Dr. Spradlin herself wrote because I, after I learned about this, actually invited her to do some reflection and sharing of her experiences. And her, her uh, article is called The Price of Passing. And she talks about the challenges for her in our academic workplace of acting as if she were straight because of her concern that if she had revealed her sexual orientation, there would be repercussions. Now mind you, whether or not there will be repercussions, sometimes it's hard to tell. What's important for those of us who are in the dominant categories to understand, because sometimes it could be, well, what's the big deal? Who cares? Right, that's, that's my take on it. In fact, I had to be thoughtful when she shared this with me, not to say, that's so what, I don't care. You know, because that in a way would be denying and demeaning that she was actually giving me a gift, that for her, she struggled long and hard. Also, for me to understand, as she shared with me, the persons that she sometimes has have come out to have not been as gracious. And in fact, because she had, remember I talked earlier about intersections of social identity? She also was the daughter of an evangelical pastor. And she herself is very, very Christian identified, very much so. So for her, there was also that kind of conflict, again, to which I cannot relate at all. So that was eye-opening for me in terms of transforming teaching and learning by unpacking privilege, because I just never even thought about myself as having that kind of privilege. And in fact, I was more concerned about uh, thinking about race privilege, right? That I don't have privilege because of my race. So this is just to get you, continue to get you thinking and feeling about these issues. I'm pleased to see some of you nodding your heads. And the idea then is that we can transform our teaching and learning by unpacking privilege and specifically thinking about the complexities of privilege. So I want to just take one moment in terms of why would we even seek to transform teaching and learning? Even though I know we're all probably on relatively the same page, I'm confident we all would agree that it's something we want to do. But why do it in terms of thinking about privilege, right? Why would we focus on that? And I'd like to hear from at least two people in the audience. Why? Without me even having gone very much into it other than my examples, and I do this intentionally because I want you to generate your own kind of ideas before I share some of mine with you. So what would be the rationale for that? And it's okay if it's sort of like, well, of course it's because blah, blah, blah. Because sometimes people have not, so for you it may be, well, of course. For others, people may not have thought about it. And oftentimes when I do anything, I invite people to think about really why, okay? So I need one person. I, I think I've learned some of your names well enough I could cold call if I have to, just saying. <laughs> and don't try to look away because that's when I really will call on you. Yes. Yes, excellent. And, and in fact, that's how privilege operates, right? It's, it's you're entitled to be oblivious. And I was so oblivious about my heterosexual privilege that it actually disrupted my kind of tendency toward a sort of self-righteousness around race privilege. So I'm just being honest with you, right? So my sense of, well, how could white people not know, right, that this happens for me because I'm black? Well, it's because it's like saying to a fish, 
hey, fish, how's that water? It's just like, well, water, right? Because it's just part of the reality. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes. So, maybe not stupid. <laughs> Just not knowing, right? So it allows you this kind of way of being in the world. Uh, latitude, you've heard the saying, born on third base and thought you hit a triple? That's what privilege is like. But it, there's a place within that for empathy, right? There's a place within that to understand that my oblivion about my sexual privilege, right? I deserve some empathy until, what? Somebody tells me, then it becomes, okay, got it. Moreover, when somebody tells me, I, should try not to say, well, what's the big deal? Or get over it, or you're being hypersensitive, right? Of really trying to understand what that might be like for someone. So thanks to both of you, and let's take just a little bit of time in terms of talking about privilege. A uh, very, a relatively simple definition to align with my work on social identity, okay? to align with that, because privilege could be any number of other sorts of things as definitions go, right? Privilege just can mean a lot of things, but how we're looking at it is how you can have an advantage status based simply on your social identity, which doesn't make you bad, good, or indifferent, whether you're on the privileged side or the not privileged side. It just is so in our society and the ways that we have organized and the systems that we have. And so another definition is a particular benefit or immunity enjoyed by a person or class of people. A couple of things to understand. Having privilege is not a negation of oppression in one's life, okay? It's not, it doesn't mean that you might not also experience some kind of oppression. Moreover, not having privilege is not an indication of powerlessness and inferiority. It's not an indication. We may be likely to feel that way, and understandably and rightfully so. So I'm not denying that. I'm just inviting us all to think about the complexities of privilege and not privilege and their significance, that significance in our lives. So are there any left-handed people in the room? Raise your hand. Come on. So some of y'all lying. You were, how many of you used to be left-handed? How many of you are passing as right-handed? How many of you say, well, I'm ambidextrous? Anybody? Uh-huh, right. <laughs> so this is actually a somewhat lighthearted but very powerful way, if you haven't heard it, to think about privilege. So my left-handers, raise your hand again. So we're left-handed, but we're in our right minds, right? And here's why it's important to think about handedness. It's an example of how privilege works. So right-handed people, do you have any sense of the challenges that we as left-handed people face? Anybody have any sense? OK, and where do you get that sense of it, sir? Okay. Okay, very good. Uh huh. Now you can. Well, actually, you know, as some of you know about sports, left hand can be a benefit because something about the mirror image as well as being unusual, right, you have an advantage. At any rate, so what happened is you had a similar experience as someone who's left handed. So you see where I'm going with this in terms of thinking about privilege or not? What else? I saw another hand. Yes. Scissors Please. Yes. So do you know, do you all right-handed people? Seriously. Do you know about scissors? They're actually designed where the way they cut, you use your right hand, right hand in terms of how it actually captures the cut. Okay? And so they now have left-handed scissors, 
but here's how language operates. And what, as I was sharing this briefly on handedness, just substitute gender, race. You see what I mean? Very similar in terms of the systems, how it's built in, and members of the dominant group typically aren't even aware unless they have a relative or a child or a friend or they've gone to some kind of teaching and education that raises their consciousness and helps them understand how these things operate. So what else? Classroom chairs. Classroom chairs and desks, yes. So you will have left-handed desk every once in a while, but for the most part what we as left-handed people have done is we have sold out and assimilated, right? And unfortunately, there's lots of research that talks about some of the challenges for left-handed people um, and some of the ways that we may not necessarily be included. So I wanted to take a calligraphy class that was offered through our uh, community center. And when I got there and the lady saw I was left-handed, oh, police, she was, oh, no, I've never taught a left-handed person. I don't know where I begin. So I'm like, oh, I guess I'm a burden, right? <laughs> excuse me for wanting to be creative. And she basically, she kind of tried, but I don't think it ever quite worked out. But I went on and actually self-taught and did this beautiful, uh, in gold, this beautiful, I think I was doing something for a friend, I can't even remember. But I actually then taught myself, right? I decided, well, okay, if she's not gonna help me. Same thing, I went to a knitting class. You know, there are other examples. And in my generation, and in my neighborhood, teachers actually tried to change kids' hands. Now, this is similar to other aspects of identity where they, the ways that people in a society deal with handedness um, is socially constructed, has a lot of different kinds of consequences. There's language such that people used to say to me, you owe the devil a day's work because you're left-handed. Language to say something is sinister, you know, this notion of left-handedness. Uh, izquierda, right, you, you're familiar with that. So that notion of left as being something challenging and not so good. Not to mention the kind of dangerous sorts of safety things related to a world designed for right-handed people. For the most part, right-handed people aren't sitting around thinking, <laughs> let's get those lefties, right? Yet, the consequences of those systems are, can be very real. And again, they vary from place to place. So we do things like pledge allegiance, um, say we're telling the truth. I mean, all of that kind of implies a valuing of the right hand in ways that the left hand, right, uh, can be negated by default. Um, so I wanted to just share that with you because talking about handedness, most people don't seem to feel as sort of like questioning or challenged about, well, well what does that mean? And yet most people kind of get it. And also understanding that what we're talking about then in terms of privilege is we're not saying because you enjoy those benefits that you're a bad person. We're also not saying for the most part, although with some other aspects of identity, there have been willful, specific ways that people are striving to discriminate and keep people out and oppress. So we don't wanna lose sight of that. However, what we're looking at is more places of hope and places where we actually can make a difference when it comes to these kinds of issues. So uh, it's built into the fabric, becomes invisible, and we then, ways we can kind of identify is ways we qualify things. So male nurse, right? So left-handed scissors. See where I'm going with that? Um, black professor. That, our language kind of leaks ways that we have, we believe dominant or non-dominant or special or different in a particular way. And those are also entry points for us to consider what we're doing and how we are indeed doing it. So also remember in terms of thinking about privilege that it's all relative to whatever, so for instance, talking about being left-handed as contrasted with talking about gender dynamics where the equity and in pay, per, inequity and in pay persists as a notion of privilege and not privilege, generally speaking. Because what happens sometimes is one person will say, well, 
in my family or my dad or my mom, right? And those are legitimate and important examples, but they neglect to look at the systemic notions, systemic notions. And perhaps you all know that um, the, one of the major sources of looking at privilege comes from Dr. Peggy McIntosh. How many of you know her unpacking the knapsack of white privilege, right? So she began this phenomenal movement of looking at privilege. And that's where I first entered it in terms of looking at white privilege. But as I've said, my experience with my colleague, Dr. Spradlin, as well as some other phenomenal transforming moments for me, led me to understand that it's, that it's more complex than looking simply at race, even as race persists as a very powerful, almost foundational notion of privilege. Because I would have, for instance, white people saying, but we were poor, right? Or, but we, I'm gay. And all of those are also legitimate. And that's where we get into intersections of identity while simultaneously recognizing the relativity of some of these aspects of identity. So that for that white male who may be poor, gay, et cetera, if he's in a certain city where he just is standing there as a white male body to hail a taxi, he may be more likely for the taxi driver to stop than for an African American male. Right, in terms of how these systems operate and how we socialize ourselves to respond to visible, so to cues about people. So I often do this and I say to people, these issues are very, very complex. And as you may recall, if you were here from my earlier talk, unfortunately, we seem to try to want to reduce and make these things simple. And it makes sense that we try to do that because maybe we think there's hope in that because when you, when you consider the complexities, that increases the challenges, but I also think it increases the likelihood that we can come together around these issues, right? And that's why uh, I enjoy this exercise we're gonna do this afternoon. Before I go into that, let me briefly say, in case you're not familiar with the history, um, I've had the privilege of uh, meeting and working with Peggy McIntosh, and she shared that she was actually at the University of Denver as a women's scholar and she was kind of uh, lamenting to an African-American female colleague about male privilege, right? About, well, men get to do this, men get to do that, et cetera. And she said, her colleague said, yeah, but Peggy, you get to do things as a white woman that I, as a black woman, can't. And Peggy said, what? Almost like me and my colleague, Dr. Spadley. She said, huh? She said, yeah, there, you get to move about in the world in ways that I can't necessarily. So Dr. McIntosh took that as a challenge, and she began to look for instances where she could say, wow, I guess that's because I'm white, and only because I'm white, right? So she generated a list, I think, of 42 items that she says white people have this invisible knapsack of privilege that lets them move about in the world, sort of like the fish in the water in ways that people who aren't white don't have those kinds of privileges and benefits. So uh, more specifically, she says, it's an invisible, weightless knapsack of special provisions, maps, passports, code books, visas, clothes, tools, and blank checks can be counted on daily, but about which the person tends to remain oblivious. So when people, when those of us who talk about privilege succeed, different kinds of emotions emerge. And it's always important to acknowledge your emotions and then also to try to, to move through and with them. So what can happen is fear and discomfort, but also what can happen with privilege itself is limited empathy because you're so accustomed to how things work. And by the way, this takes nothing from the reality, right? So uh, I remember a white student saying, my dad, you know, we were poor. My dad worked hard and made, you know, he became successful. And that is phenomenal. I take nothing from that, right? Even as the possibility exists that had my dad lived and tried to do the same thing, he may not have had the same success. 
And that doesn't make either of them right or wrong. It makes the thinking about the situation important. And it makes us as educators to be aware of in what ways can we strive to level the playing field or whatever, however else we want to call it, so that again, all of our students in all of their intersections of identity feel capable, feel valued, and feel equipped. Um, what also happens sometimes is that um, as we look at, you, have you heard of the culture of poverty ideology? So this is a mindset which says that poor people, it's their fault that they are poor. So what can happen is, again, from our positions of privilege in terms of social class and also ways we indoctrinate one another, we kind of have these assumptions about members of other groups. And this is why it's important to unpack this notion of privilege. And what also then happens when people learn about privileges, they may want to deny it, they want to minimize it, they may want to rationalize, they want to say, well, let's just look at how we're the same. And of course, I think we ought to do that, even as we also ought to think about the potential for uh, really looking closely at privilege and its intersections to help us unpack privilege and use it to an advantage. So, what I've, uh, I'm very pleased that some of my colleagues at Metropolitan State University of Denver, I went to a conference with uh, some of them, and they were actually using this exercise that I'm just going to give you a taste of, that um, I now call the privilege beads exercise. They were doing it as a privilege paper clip exercise, where they actually had different colors of paper clips and um, use them with groups of people, the intention being to really look at various aspects of privilege, going well beyond race, and to ask people who work in groups to think about the power of their combined, their collective privilege as a community, okay? And uh, the, all of the instructions about how to do this exercise were on my website, differencematters.info, this I want to show you, this is what we use in those uh, exercises. So imagine if we'd had the time today that, uh, and I think I have ability privilege, nationality privilege, religious privilege, sexuality privilege, race privilege, class privilege, gender privilege. So you have one of these set on e at each station and you have a big bowl of beads. This, the, the last time I did this with a group, these are my privilege beads, right? So you all today just get one bead to symbolize this because we didn't have time to go through it. And also, you all got beautiful beads. Thank me for getting you some really nice beads. I'm just saying. Because as you can see, when you do the full exercise, you cannot afford to have that many beads for each person to, to actually, we call it wear your bling, wear your privilege, carry your privilege with you. So these are the beads that I collected when I went through this exercise, where at the table then, say the ability privilege table, there is a bowl of these beads. And what I tend to do is I like to play native flute music in the background. I ask them, in fact, um, hold on one moment. I think I pulled up the instructions just to give you a sense of how I do this. Hmm? Oh, I think I have it on, online. So to explore, the purpose of this exercise is to explore ways we enjoy privilege based on being members of social identity groups in the United States. Please note that this exercise is not meant to make anyone feel guilty or ashamed of his or her privilege or lack of privilege related to any social identity categories. Rather, it seeks to highlight the fact that everyone has some privilege. So oftentimes when I work in groups like this, I talk about how privileged are we that we can read and write, right? And how did you get to learn how to read and write? Because you were born in a society where education, some kind of education, and we've had varying degrees, right, was available. Moreover, laws and policies, back to um, the, the gentleman for the library, right, that we can have access. That's privilege. That is privilege. You didn't do anything special 
except be born at the time and place when you were, right, that you have that kind of access. So all of us have some, even as some have more than others. By illuminating our various privileges as individuals, we can recognize systemic notions of privilege, and we can work individually and collectively for social justice and equity. And I also say that these aren't exhaustive. So sometimes, especially academics, they want to analyze and say, well, you don't have one on there about such and such. Or this one, when I was little, it was that way. And I say, yes, and. The point of this is to really help us dig a little deeper than most of us have in terms of thinking about how privilege operates. So certainly, eight statements will not capture, right, the variety of issues related to privilege. But each person goes to each station very quietly. As I said, I like to play a little harp music in the background. I invite people to take this as a reverent exercise in which you realize for every bead that you pick up, there's probably someone in the room who won't pick that bead up. For every bead you don't pick up, there's probably someone who can. And rather than seeing that as someone's better or worse or feel guilty or feel whatever, to see the, that together, right? So what happens then, always everybody has some beads. And then what I've also started doing is I used to color code the beads. So I have white bead for which aspect? For race, yeah. I had um, green for money, 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 social class, right? Um, but then I just I realized no, because that could be outing people somehow, right? So then I just throw a whole lot, plus make my life easier, then I have to sort the bees and go through all that. But at any rate, and also I say to people, especially if it's like at a conference or something where we're gonna be together, people may choose to like put it all together as one thing. So when we did the paperclip one, people were so creative. But then actually a group of students on my downtown campus asked if they could do the exercise and that's why I love students. They came up with, let's use beads instead of paper clips. That also ended up much cheaper, and they actually then provided the string, right? And so as I said, I stopped using color coding. And then you give people an option that they can, if they want to wear them all fine. I had a white male in a uh, seminar that I did on my book, Teaching Matters, as a, uh, an institute, teaching institute. And he probably got maybe close to all of the beads. And he was feeling a little guilt around that. And uh, you know, in terms of, wow, I have all of these, he's just like a hit, the privileged jackpot. And I said, yes, and good for you, and I'm so glad that you're, you're going to be in places where you can talk about these issues in ways that I might not. And how wonderful for you that you have these kinds of privileges and how you can use them for good, rather than feeling badly about it. But he decided that he would just maybe take one to symbolize, rather than kind of like having this long, you know, he could like, make a vest. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, it, but it was very helpful for him to receive it in that way. And I'm very pleased to tell you that that student, um, and he's, I say student, he's actually a faculty member who is at a faculty development institute at Hope College. And so he later sent me a YouTube video. It turns out he teaches at a male uh, private institution and they do something called chapel, chapel presentation. So he did his chapel presentation on the privileged jackpot. And he actually played with that, he's like, ding, 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 I'm white, ding, 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 I'm straight, ding, 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 you know, the jackpot. And he talked with these young men about what that could mean in positive ways. So it's really important to think about it in that way. And the list is meant to focus on your current status in life, which may mean that you haven't always enjoyed the privileges that you can identify today, or that you may have less privilege in a category that you once did. As we think about, for instance, ability status, that is such a, um, a potentially, not it is powerful, but you know, for all of us, blink of an eye, our ability status can change, right? Blink of an eye, it can change temporarily or forever. And I often start, you know, when I have time to really work with groups, I start with the ability um, one. Because fascinating to me is most of the ways that those groups who are intentionally trying to dominate other groups is they, invoked, they invoke ability. So uh, black people are inferior intelligence, right? Women are weaker 
um, persons who are not straight, right? Are they have something mentally wrong? You see what I mean? So ability is this interesting kind of way that we use to justify to oppress one another. So with that said, I'm going to take you through a highly, highly, highly abbreviated version of the Privileged Beads workshop. What happens after they go around and get their beads, and as I said, I ask them to do it very silently and reverently and to reflect on what it may mean as they're taking a bead or not. Then uh, we have string available for anyone who wants to string theirs, and we then have a conversation. And I invite people to reflect on what it means to them. I'm so pleased to say that same group is called co-leads and it's student leaders on my campus. Every year they now do this exercise. And they reflect on themselves as current and aspiring leaders of collectively on our campus what they can do when it comes to this notion of privilege or not, but then as they intend to move forward in the world. And so similarly, I'm inviting you to reflect, as I said earlier, to engage in this, to reflect on this notion of privilege for you specifically and collectively, as well as how you might then apply this in working with your students and others of thinking about this notion of privilege. So, with the Privilege Beads exercise, I would like for you to take a sheet of paper and, and you can either, you, you, it's your option. You don't necessarily have to have a sheet of paper. I just want you to keep a tally. And the way you'll do the tally is just to draw, well, you don't even have to draw a line down your paper. You can just, every statement that I read, you can, uh, you can write Y or N, okay? So that means everybody will be writing something down. And that means then, I, you know, different from when you do the privilege beads exercise, I say to people, pay attention to you and what beads you're selecting or not. This is not about you trying to see what other people are doing. And so with this one, I invite you to write a Y or an N so that then everybody is always responding somehow, okay? And similar to how I do with these other groups is I invite you to just reflect on what, that, what your response means. If it's a no, reflect on how, if at all, has that, the fact that you say no to that item, how does that matter to you? And how does it matter to how you perform your role? And how, quite frankly, might you, in a, in a fascinating way, be empowered by the fact that you bring that not having the privilege, right, into the academy? You follow that? Similarly, if it's a why, for you to think about, wow, that, I, I just hadn't thought about that. I recall two white male students in an undergraduate course that I taught when I succeeded with this, and, I'm, and I'm, I, I appreciate that I'm continuing to grow and learn because at that point, I was just doing white privilege. And I succeeded in helping those students understand this, and uh, in their reflection papers, two white males separately talked about how that knowledge, one said he just had a headache you know, thinking about, wow, you know, I have all these things that I never thought about. I just got them just because of my family and who I am and not that I necessarily did anything. Another student um, talked about having a stomach ache. So this is ne never meant to leave people feeling that way. And so that was my impetus for going deeper into this, my impetus for saying, here's what you do once you realize this, that you don't have to reside. I never tell people to deny their emotions, but to take those emotions and how can you turn them into something that feels positive. Uh, so with that said, uh, are there any questions about the ex what we're gonna do? So I just have, I think, three statements for a select few of the actual items, just again to give you a taste of it. Any questions? Excellent, let's proceed. So, social class privilege. And by the way, this is for now. So my goodness, when I think about where I came from and where I am now, it's amazing in terms of social class. And yet, as I said, that a lot of my memories and understanding remain with me in terms of being in, from a single parent household and what that meant to me that I try to bring that understanding in ways that I can back to Stephen Covey, my spheres of influence, right, where I can try to make a difference. So, uh, statement number one. I can be sure that my social class will be an advantage if I seek medical or legal help. My social class will be an advantage if I seek medical or legal help. I am reasonably sure that I or my family will not have to skip meals because we cannot afford to eat. <laughs> 
I don't have to rely on public transportation to travel to work or school. I can afford my own vehicle. So for those of you who are green-minded and so forth, it doesn't mean whether or not you actually have a car. It means if you wanted to, could you? Next, ability privilege. I can assume that I will easily have physical access to any building in all areas within that building. I have never been taunted, teased, or socially ostracized due to a disability. I don't have to decide whether or not to disclose that I have an invisible disability to an employer or teacher. Very briefly, um, I had eye-opening experience with a student who um, came out to me as uh, uh, Asperger's diagnosis, who then recounted that a faculty member in one of the departments where I worked, when that same student trusted that faculty member by telling him that he has Asperger's, that faculty member said, oh, dude, I thought maybe you were coming to class high. I knew something was going on. So, you know, just in his, in, in his awkward way to try to relate just further, that student was devastated and actually trusted me to even share that with me. That helped my resolve in terms of helping all, all of us understand these issues. Uh, also for some of those students, uh, the idea, students and employees, right, that if it's optional to disclose whether or not you should. Even as we're legally required for certain accommodations, there are many, many challenges around how people actually implement those. Religion privilege. I can assume that I will not have to go to work or school on my religious holidays. I do not worry about consequences of disclosing my religious identity to others. Implicit or explicit references to religion where I work or go to school conform to my religious beliefs. Another quick story, I did a um, in-service for a group of high school teachers in the Colorado area. In fact, it was Columbine High School. And I did that exercise I mentioned this morning about if you had three identity categories, what would they be? And one of those teachers said that in this, that context, she would put Jewish because for her, that was highly salient because it was such a Christian-centric context. She um, elaborated, though, it wasn't because she felt that people were maligning her for being Jewish, right, or saying anything negative. It was just that there was such this strong assumption of Christianity that she felt she couldn't really be or sort of express herself. So she didn't have any sense that her colleagues were trying to ostracize it or anything, but it was just a, an increased salience. And important for us to understand for many of these categories, especially if we're dominant, you know, we're in the dominant, that ways we can feel easy in our workplaces and classrooms, some people just may not. Uh, and it doesn't have to be because there's anything we're doing explicitly to try to ostracize or exclude, but there are things we can do to be more mindful and heartfelt. Sexuality privilege. I can move about in public without fear of being harassed or physically attacked because of my sexuality. I can go for months without me or anyone else referring explicitly to my sexuality, explicitly, because that implicit assumption of heterosexuality is just so infused in what we do. People don't ask me why I chose my sexual orientation. Race privilege. In all of my educational experiences, that is from P through 20 or wherever, curricula have taught about my race First of all, taught about my race at all, and then second, in positive ways. When I shop, I feel assured that store employees will not follow me or closely watch me because of my race. I'm still experiencing that. And, and people will say, oh, they weren't watching you, or maybe she was. So you know, this idea of kind of rationalizing, which could mean well, but I have lived this all of my life. And yes, part of it is, uh, people who are my race have kind of taught me to expect that. And another part of it is, it really does happen, right? I mean, it just feels too obvious uh, 
that I go into a boutique and suddenly the person who is working there is right by my area, like rearranging things or whatever. So sometimes I intentionally kind of move around just to see, is this me or is this, you know? So again, that's my perception and perception is reality. And in some of those situations, they may not be doing it, right? Just to be fair, but it's part of that kind of um, uh, way of being in the world, that second guessing, that's also different than persons who are privileged. I am never asked to speak for all the people of my racial group. That's like a big capital N-O for me. Um, in, in terms of, and also for many of our students uh, in, of color, especially on predominantly white campuses, who talk about feeling I, either hyper invisible in classrooms or hyper visible. So when it, when that that one little marginalized section on diversity, which often then is just about race and sometimes just about black and white, then it becomes Jamal, you're black. Tell us about that. Not maybe that explicit, but it feels that way. Right? Rather than having all students understand that they're raced and doing it in a way that's striving for understanding, empathy, and progress. Finally, sex and gender privilege. If I have children in a successful career, few people will ask me, my goodness, how do you balance your professional and personal lives? I have a female colleague who's extremely prolific, and she has five children. And uh, people just, people ask her that, and I'm like, are y'all asking her husband that? Right? Major religions in the world are led mainly by the people of the same sex as I am. I do not have to think about the message my wardrobe sends about my sexual availability. So good people, for all of these, there are on these uh, sheets, and by the way, they, I'm pretty sure I have this in Word, so that means you could change if there are particular kinds of things related to what you're teaching or your professions or whatever, you can readily change them. My phenomenal executive assistant, she will laminate me if I stand still, so <laughs> she, she laminated this and it becomes very useful, right, for this exercise. I want to take just, um, I want to pause for five minutes or so and invite you, in fact, what I'm gonna do more specifically, I wanna take two minutes for each of you just to reflect on your responses, right? For you to reflect on, uh, begin to generate, so what, right? So I like to use, perhaps you've heard this, what, so what, now what, right? So what if anything, it, it, does this kind of call to you? You know, what does it say to you about privilege and how you might unpack it to transform teaching and learning? And what, and then, then I'll um, ask you to share a little bit about what you're coming with. So I'm gonna give you two minutes of personal reflection time. To think about what, in fact, let me just fast forward to call to action. Based on what we have shared today, what in terms of thinking about unpacking privilege to transform teaching and learning, what kinds of things are you doing that you wanna stop doing? What kinds of things do you realize, well, I've kind of, I've kind of been doing that already, so I wanna keep doing that? And finally, is there anything you wanna start doing as a result of this um, thinking and feeling about privilege. And as you do that, I have some ideas. One is just to become vigilant in a, a curious and open way about how you are operating from positions of privilege and the various decisions you're making and things that you're doing. Two is, especially for those of us who have some clarity that we're members of uh, traditionally oppressed groups, is to think about how do we optimize that, right? Um, I appreciated uh, Dr. Gordon talking about how your programs help those multicultural students see the value in their identities, right? They see themselves as resources for that campus. 
And they then, what that must do to their self-esteem and so forth. So those are things to consider, right, in terms of how do you optimize in authentic and with integrity ways. Another thing is to engage in dialogue and not debate around these issues. So imagine doing this kind of exercise with your small team and inviting people to talk about, you know, what any of their beads represent to them or inviting them to talk about how, if at all, their awareness of not having particular beads has mattered to them or matters to them in that situation. So that conversation with Anna Spradlin, Dr. Spradlin, when I, my eyes were opened about my heterosexual privilege, she and I had many, many conversations where she helped me understand that the woman that she'd been bringing to some of our events as her roommate was actually her phenomenal life partner. Uh, she helped me understand that I could come in on the weekend and talk about the latest loser I had dated, um, you know, who, and yeah, I did, but I got over that. Um, and now I have a phenomenal life partner, my goodness. If I had to go through all of them to get to him, it's like, let's go, let's do it again. But at any rate, I could readily come in and talk about that and not even think about it. Moreover, I realized amazingly in a discipline like communication at that time, uh, work on interpersonal communication and so forth, rarely if at all mentioned persons who are in relationships like hers. So we changed that, you see what I mean? So thinking about it in that way, but having dialogue, um, considering how you may or may not enjoy those privilege the, privileges and how they might transform. So in this moment, I want you to hold your bead. And I want you to think of this bead and take this bead with you um, as a representation of what we've shared today as a representation that for every one of you, even with this small version of the Privilege Beats exercise, I trust you got more clarity, even if you were aware of these issues, of ways that you may tend to enjoy privilege and ways that you may not, but in a way that empowers you, in a way that I trust also assigns you to be responsible and responsive in terms of privilege and transforming teaching and learning. And I also want you then to make the commitment, it's just to yourself, in terms of if that resonates for you, anyone on that, on that thing, stop, continue, start. I want you to make a promise to yourself. And I have my beads here, and I, I as I think I've told you, I continue to learn and to grow. And so I know for me, a key one of these is ability privilege. Um, and I realize that walking around this campus and so forth, like a up and down steps and so forth, one of the things I realize is because of my family history, um, the likelihood, I'm the last one standing in my family that does not have diabetes. Uh, my, my siblings, my mom, uh, my grandparents and, the, and their siblings had limbs amputated and so forth. I have the benefit and the privilege of education. I have the privilege of being financially secure that I can eat, I can buy, you know, eat well. I have, so that's how I am optimizing my privilege in terms of my physical health, right? Because I, those who know better ought to do better. So I want to continue that even as I also want to be thoughtful and mindful that everybody isn't in that same kind of situation. Because sometimes I judge people. And that's what can happen with privilege, right? It's, I don't know why, they'll just don't, it's like, yeah, you don't know why, right? So I, that's my pledge to myself, I share with you, and I invite you to make, take a moment to make a pledge to yourself. And as you do that, let's, share energy with one another and support in service of how we will use our privilege to transform teaching and learning. Thank you very, very much. All right, we're nearing the end. And on behalf of the Tilford Planning Committee, we have a nice gift. Ooh, lovely parting gift. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for your words of wisdom.